Hello everyone. This is Dr. Brasher and we'll be talking about the peripheral nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. So when we hit on the peripheral nervous system, this is going to consist of all the neural structures that's outside the central nervous system, which we talked earlier, um, which included the brain and spinal cord. And they can actually be broken down into four parts. That's the sensory receptors, the transmission lines, these are nerves and their structures and their repair mechanisms, a motor ends and motor activity and reflex activity. And some of this we've talked about and we're gonna go into a little bit deeper information about it. So we do have the central nervous system, which was um, lesson 11, part one. And you can see the red lines are gonna be as they basically more like efferent pathways going and communicating um, down the, the scheme here. And the blue lines are gonna be bringing information back up or in the afferent division. So you can see the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system communicate back and forth together. That's represented rather nicely with those arrows showing that they do help to communicate back and forth to allow your body to be pretty effective and efficient and to respond the way that it needs to. Now we take sensory information in so that our nervous system can figure out what it needs to do. And so this is that sensory afferent division. And this is what we will be talking about in lesson 12. And we will be focusing on eyes and ears for that. Now, when it brings stuff out, we were gonna wanna see a response. And that's when you're gonna look at the motor or afferent division. And we've talked a little bit about this. This can be divided into the somatic nervous system so we can think about skeletal muscles here, and then the autonomic nervous system, which are gonna provide those basic things to um, basically keep the body running. Now, as you go through, you can see that the autonomic nervous system is divided into two parts. They're both called the sympathetic division and the parasympathetic. And basically, um, the Sympathetic, you can think of fight or flight. And so that's gonna be what helps to keep your body mobilized during activity and to um, basically, if you ever have anything for which you may be in danger, that's gonna be what helps to get you to safety. And the parasympathetic is the rest and relax. And that is going to promote like functions to conserve energy and like just simple day-to-day -day kind of things like maybe you're sitting down, you're eating, you're watching TV, those kind of things. So that's how the peripheral nervous system is divided. Now, the very first thing we want to talk about here is when we activate the peripheral nervous system, how does that happen? What information um, comes in or how do we get that information in? So there are a, a combination of different um, receptors that track different stimuli. And so here, this is what we're gonna start with. And so we have mechanoreceptors and these are gonna be what responds to touch, pressure, vibration, and stretch. Um, we've talked about thermoreceptors a lot, and these are what are sensitive to changes in temperatures. Photoreceptors, we're gonna talk about this in the next lecture, and this is basically a response to light energy. And so an example of where you would find these are basically in the retina. Now chemoreceptors, you're gonna basically focus on these a little bit more when you get to anatomy and physiology too, because these respond to chemicals. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, what kind of chemicals can you think about? Well, don't you bring in food? Those are chemicals. And so there are um, molecules in that that will allow for things like taste, 
There are, um, when the food is being cooked, it releases chemicals into the air for smell. You can even get changes in your blood chemistry. So think about sugar and how the homeostatic effects of um, diabetes works. And this can be more, also the changes in blood chemistry can be related to um, your, your metabolism or how fast you breathe and the changes in pH, which can change your, um, or the changes in the amount of carbon dioxide that's in your body, which can change your pH. The last one we're gonna talk about are called nociceptors. And so these are actually sensitive to pain. So we can think of what it feels like when you get burned, so extreme heat or even cold. If you have excessive pressure on your arm, say you're snuggling with your boo at night in bed and it just starts like someone's on it and it just starts hurting a lot. Or even when you hurt yourself and you have those inflammatory chemicals there. So those are all the different types of classification based on stimulus type, right? So you can see the stimulus here is either touch or pressure, temperature, light energy, chemicals, or stimuli that will activate um, pain. So those are like heat or cold. So it's the stimulus type. That's how we classify these. But these aren't the only kind of receptors that we have. We also can classify them based on location. So exterior receptors, just like the name says at the beginning, you can think exit. So you're gonna find these basically, they're gonna respond to stimuli that's outside the body. So we can think these receptors are found in the skin. So in the skin, you'll feel things like touch, pressure, pain, and temp. And so these basically are within those special organs. So interoceptors or visceroceptors are exactly what you think on at the beginning of here. They're found in the internal viscera and blood vessels. They're sensitive to chemical changes. Stretch and temp. And so these a lot of times can sometimes cause discomfort, but usually a person is unaware of their workings. Aware. And the last one here is proprioceptors. And so these are important for detecting stretch in skeletal muscles. Tendons, joints. Ligaments. and connective tissue that's covering bone or muscle.
So if you think about it, these inform the brain of one's movement. So you can see the interoceptors also talk about stretch, but you have to look at where they're located. Those are the internal viscera, they're in blood vessels. That's why sometimes you can feel that you can feel like a discomfort, but normally um, if these are working in terms of say your blood vessels working either doing vasoconstriction or vasodilation and being able to feel that difference in stretch, you're not gonna really feel that per se. But the proprioceptors are actually part of your cognitive movement, your conscious movement, I should say more so. And so you're going to be able to feel basically these or be more conscious or aware of these because they're in a response to your movement. So the third one we're going to talk about is classification by receptor structure here. And so general senses include tactile senses, which are touch, pressure, stretch, vibration. They also include temperature, pain, and muscle sense. So no one receptor, one function relationship exists. Receptors can respond to multiple stimuli. Now, when we look at these, receptors can either be encapsulated, um, and that means their nerve endings are surrounded by a lot of tissue, or they can be encapsulated, which means the nerves are free ending, and these are located in different places. So the unencapsulated, you're going to see generally in skin, bone, internal organs, and joints, and you can see they don't have extra tissue around them. But in the um, encapsulated nerves, if example here is that carpusal, you're going to see that it has a lot of that encapsulated tissue around the end of the nerve. And so you're going to find these in deeper tissues and muscles. So that's the first part that we want to talk about in terms of when we are looking at the schematic at the beginning, talking about information coming in and that being receptors. Now, once that information comes in, we need to start being able to process that, and that's sensory processing. So our survival depends on two main things, sensation and perception. Sensation is the awareness of change in our internal and external environment, and perception is the conscious interpretation of those stimuli. And so when we're talking about that, we have the somatosensory system. This is part of the sensory system that's serving the body, walls, and limbs. And they receive input from external receptors, proprioceptors, interoceptors, to allow for that input to be relayed towards the head, but processed along the way. And all of that is... And so we use the somatosensory system, which we've talked about a little bit before. This is the system that uses the input from these receptors and your sensory neurons to interpret touch, pressure, proprioceptive input. As you remember, that has to do with stretching of skeletal muscles, tendons, joints, ligaments, connective tissue, all of those things um, associated basically with bones and muscles and pain. And they move through a process of levels from one to three, with the beginning starting here at level one, and this is a receptor level. So here you're gonna get sensory reception and transmission to the central nervous system from examples like joints, where you have some of the stretch receptors, uh, along with muscle spindle fibers and free nerve endings on your skin that can help to detect pain, cold, warmth. And all of that is going to process and go up through level two, which is the circuit level. And this is the processing that happens in the ascending pathway, the pathway going up to the brain. And so you can see that it hits through the spinal cord, the medulla, and the pons, and you can see where those interactions are happening between the axons 
in different cell bodies there. And even some of them going and not actually connecting with very specific um, nerves. Our third level, as you can see, goes up here, is the perceptual level. And this is the processing in the cortical sensory centers. So here you can actually see as it goes up that it is communicating with that somatosensory cortex to allow our bodies to know what to do with the sensory information that we get with the somatic um, system, right? And so this is essentially the three basic levels of integration in the sensory system. Now we can get homeostatic imbalances and we talked about this earlier. So this can deal with homeostatic imbalances, which we had hit on earlier. So long lasting intensive pain known as hyperalgia. This is pain amplification and this is associated with chronic pain and even if they remove a limb, phantom limb pain. And what happens is the pain receptors modulate and allow the spinal cord to basically learn this pain amplification process. And so that's why it's so important at early stages of pain to manage pain to reduce the likelihood that it will turn into chronic pain. And as we talked about earlier, we do have visceral pain, and this is stimulation of the visceral organs, pain receptors. So you can feel this kind of pain, and it may be vague, aching, gnawing, kind of burning. And it can be activated by any of the following, tissue stretching, ischemia, chemicals, or muscle spasms. Now, referred pain, as we talked about previously, is pain from one body region that's perceived from a different region. So visceral and somatic pain fibers actually travel in the same nerve. So the brain assumes stimulus from common somatic regions can be a problem. And so this is why you get your left arm can actually have pain during a heart attack. And these are all the different and the ones that we kind of pointed out in class basically is this idea because more people deal with this than others is this um, area right here. You can see pain when you have a heart attack can go basically in your chest all the way down to your arm. Or even another one that's kind of interesting is this liver where it can actually come up here and be in this area um, on your shoulder. And the last one is this gallbladder, right, where it can be kind of a little bit farther actually on the shoulder. The other one's between the shoulder and the neck. And so all of those kind of give you a really good idea of um, ref referred pain. So when we talk about how the peripheral nervous system works, we want to kind of look at what peripheral nervous system nerves look like. So most nerves are mixtures of efferent and efferent fibers and somatic and autonomic fibers. And so we have mixed nerves, right? And we talked a little bit about these already as well. And so these contain both sensory and motor fibers. Sensory afferent is going to be basically, they're going to have impulses that go towards the central nervous system. And motor efferent are going to be those that have impulses that go away. And so we kind of looked at this a little bit and we're gonna look at this um, underneath a slide as well. And so as you notice, we have some of the same terminology that we saw when we looked at muscles and I'm kind of underlining them and circling them. So you have basically this epineurium layer that kind of keeps everything in and you can see that 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 is on the outside there of this and this is a um, structure of a nerve that we're going to look at and then we have basically a combination of axons that are grouped together and held together by the perineurium and so you can see these groups are called fascicles 
Now, the fascicles contain individual nerves or axons. Now, those nerve axons are um, coated with the next layer called the endoneurium. And so this kind of gives you an idea of what they look like. So when we talk about peripheral ner neurons, they can be pure sensory or pure motor. So sensory is efferent and pure motor is efferent. But those cases are rare. Most nerves are mixed. And so you can look at types of fibers in mixed nerves. And they make sense because if you look here, we have somatic. And if you remember, somatic has to do with muscles. And so, and this is why it's so important to ba basically hold on to some of that information you had. Because those mixed nerves tell you exactly what they're doing if you know the terminology already and you're not gonna have to remember it. So we know somatic afferent. And so if we take our example that we talked about before when you step on something, right? or that's gonna have the information coming from some part of your body, and then it's gonna have to go up to either your spinal cord or your brain, right? And so we know that has to do with afferent. So that afferent term is sensory, right? And so this kind of is a nice way to look and say, okay, somatic afferent has to do with sensory information going from the place that it's happening, right? The muscle to the brain. Somatic, again, we know it's gonna have to do with muscle, but now we see the term efferent, which we've talked about before. And this is going back from the brain to the part of the body. So you can see that the somatic efferent is gonna be a motor because sensory goes to the brain, motor comes back, right? So motor from the brain to the muscle. Now, visceral, we know visceral has to do with organs, the idea of viscera, right? And so here, we know visceral afferent is going to be sensory again, and it goes up from organs to brain. And visceral is going to be brain to organ. And we know it's going to be a motor. So you can kind of remember all of these based on what you've already learned in the class, and it becomes a little bit easier to deal with and remember. So when we have peripheral nerves, it's very important for them to be able to regenerate. But they can only regenerate the damage if it's not too severe. Now to do this, they do go into four steps. Step one, basically the axon fragments. And the myelin sheath, which I'm just gonna put MS there for shorthand, will actually start to degenerate in the distal region. Think about this, distal is farther away. So if there's any kind of damage where things are leaking out, then the soma or the cell body can't get what it needs to the axon that's past that point. And so you can kind of see that it's open right there. And this, it actually is a term for this. Wallerian degeneration. And so as this progresses, the degeneration will continue to spread down the axon. Now, the second step that you're gonna see here is basically you're gonna start having macrophages clean up. So they're gonna remove all the dead axon debris and everything else. And then the Schwann cells start to divide. Because a bunch of them have died whenever that axon was damaged and we need more of those to help repair that um, myelin sheath that's there. Now, the 
third process that you're going to have here, you're going to start seeing that the axon filaments are going to grow three regeneration tubes. So here you can see that there's damage, right? If you look at the first one, there's a big opening there. Things can start to move out. And so it's still open. You see macrophages here. They're here to start cleaning up all that debris. And then you're going to start getting myelin sheath um, produced from, or the Schwann cell starting to reproduce so that they can make myelin sheath. And the regeneration tubes are there from the swan cells. The swan cells have actually formed them. And you can see it's starting to come together here so we can bring together those two parts of the axons that were separated from the damage. And this last part, the axon regenerates and the outside myelin, new myelin sheath is formed. And you can see all of that right there, right? The new myelin sheath that's all going around that cell. It's all being formed. So those are the four steps. And this can only happen if the damage is not too severe. If you completely cut this nerve, it won't be able to regenerate. Now, when we talk about peripheral nerves, we have nerves that come out of the brain that go out to talk to the rest of the body, right? And so these are the cranial nerves. And we have cranial nerves that go from 1 to 12. And we talked about these in class, so I'm not going to reiterate and waste your time on doing that. But you can see on here that they put them by Roman numerals, right? And they start, so this thing right here, when you're looking at it, we are talking about number one, right? And so you have one here, you have two here, you have three there, and you have four. And then you go a little bit farther back and you have five. And then we go to where the brain stem and all of that is. And you have six here, seven there, right? And then if you look right next to it, it is eight. And then you have nine here, you have 10, you have 11, and on this top over here, you have 12. So you should know the function. You need to know whether they're sensory or motor or mixed and um, what they're called and if they're cranial, um, cranial nerve one, two, or three. Now, also what's important to the peripheral nervous system is the parts of the spine that come out that are going to allow to make our plexus and um, be able to communicate moving forward. And as you know, the spinal cord is a continuation of the medulla oblongata of the brain. It is about 16 to 18 inches in length, and we know it is protected the same way um, that the brain is protected. It has bone or the vertebrae. It has the spinal menges. It has the um, cerebral spinal fluid. And it also has fibrocartilage disc that are in here. Now, its function is to convey sensory input from the periphery of the brain. So it conveys sensory impulses from the periphery to brain. And this is kind of just a, re a review, right? And so this is the ascending track. And is that all it does? No, right? It conveys motor impulses from the brain to the muscle and gland.
It's also important, so here's our two, but it's also important in, in the third function that we're going to get is integrate reflexes. So those are its three major functions. And so as you can see on here, and we, we hit on this before, we have the posterior side and the anterior side. You can tell it's posterior because it has that root ganglion there. And they come together and fuse to actually form 31 pairs of spinal nerves. So when we look at the parts of the spine, right, we, the spine actually has the three main functions, and there are 31 pairs of these spinal nerves that come out and help to allow your body to respond both through sensory and motor functions. Now, with this being said, when these particular nerves come out, let me show you what this looks like. Out here, right, you have them coming in and they come together, but as they leave, there's parts that will continue to move out and go this way. There's parts that will go towards the front, and there's little bitty ones that go off, right? And it's kind of hard to tell, but you can kind of see them here. But they just don't show you very good direction right there. So the ones that tend to go towards the back are called the dorsal ramus. And so they receive input from skin, joints, and muscle. of the posterior trunk. The second is the meningeal branch. Sorry, put it extra. G in there. And this basically is going to re enter the vertebrae for stimulation of vertebrae structures. So this is important for actually supplying the nerve function to the vertebrae themselves. And so that includes the ligaments, the dura, the blood vessels, the intervertebral disc, the facet joints, the peristenum, all of that of the actual vertebrae. Because the vertebrae is sensing information too, or how would you know if you've hurt your back? They also communicate with and contain autonomic nerves that's going to carry um, visceral motor and sensory information to visceral organs. So the meningeal branch is important. And the third is the ventral ramus. And that's used to stimulate the muscles. And that's basically of the thorax, abdominum, or the abdomen, and back. Now, the ventral rami 
of the cervical, brachial, lumbar, and sacral fuse to actually form the plexus or the networks of nerves. The thoracic region maintains about 11 pairs of nerves, and those are called the intercostal nerves, and they have no network. And so we have already talked about this, and so we have the cervical plexus, the brachial plexus, um, the intercostal nerves, and then we have both the lumbar and the sacral plexus, and you can look through those and um, look at how they relate to the different cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral nerves. And we actually talked about this in the last lecture and what major nerves are involved for all of these. So I'm going to go ahead and move forward with, the, with this. But this is part of the peripheral nervous system. We talked about it a little bit, or we talked about it in the central nervous system because basically you have the central nervous system that is right here. And those are going to come out from that and interact with the rest of the body, either come out or bring information in. And as you remember, we talked about how the central nervous system is so important and works to control motor functions um, in the peripheral system. So you have the cerebellum, the basal nuclei in the brain that coordinate complex motor activity, and simple motor activities are con controlled by the spinal cord. And so we talked about these three different levels. We have the segmental level, which are reflexes, the projection level, which are intermediate responses that are controlled by the brainstem and motor cortex and relates to po um, posture, eye, and head movement, and the pre-command level, which is the highest response or the apex response that's controlled by the cerebellum and the basal ganglia, and these are voluntary moment, movements. When we look at the hierarchy of motor control, we have basic sensory input that can come in, and it can directly work and come in to the, at the segmental level. And so this is the spinal cord, right? And it is a reflex activity, so it's going to go out immediately to motor. Now, sensory input can also, if it's somewhere in the middle, can go and through the spinal cord and then hit this next layer. And so this is the motor cortex, pyramidal pathways, the brain stem, this is the vestibular um, areas and the reticular formation. And this is going to basically tell the spinal cords, motor nerves to work and instructions on how to work. And it sends a copy of that information to the higher level. And so then you'll get this information. Now, all of this, as you can see, can go indirectly or up to the pre-command level. And this is basically um, programs and gives instructions on how to work. And you can also get stuff coming in from the segmental level to come up there. And this is going to program and give instructions um, to work with the movement, and it can be modified by feedback. And so you can see here that this is going to talk back to the projection level and go through the segmental level. So it's going to basically come back through all of that motor cortex, through the spinal cord, so that it can relate information back to motor output. And so let's talk about one of the most basic, again, is the reflex arc. And this falls under, if you're looking at the hierarchy of motor control, remember it falls under the segmental level. And so this is involuntary if you step on something. And remember, you have the receptors in the skin that is part of the sensory nerve. And so it'll go through there, then through the sensory nerve or afferent neuron to an interneuron in the spinal cord and back through a motor neuron to an effector or muscle. And the types of reflexes are both somatic reflexes, that's skeletal, or autonomic reflexes, which go to smooth muscle. And this shows, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time because we did talk about this, and so number one is down here. This is number two. Number three is here. Number four is there. And down here is number five. So those are the four parts, and it allows you to instantly be able to remove yourself in the event of some kind of 
damage. And again, if you remember, the one thing that we had with the patellar reflex that was different, and if you remember, the one thing that we had with the teller, patellar reflex that was different is right here, it doesn't have an interneuron. So you can tell how well sensory nerves and motor nerves communicate without having to integrate here. And so all of this is important because we're talking about our central nervous system communicating with the peripheral nervous system. And so as you can see, we have a really nice schematic here that starts with the nervous system. And this was this, um, basically looking at, as you can see here, so, as you can see here, here's a really nice scheme to kind of explain what we're talking about and how everything works. And so this is an overview, a really nice overview too, that makes things a little bit more straightforward. So let's kind of break it down a little bit. And we have the nervous system and that's what we've been talking about for a couple weeks now. And that can be divided into both the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. Well, what's part of the central nervous system? Well, we have two, right? We have the brain that receives and processes sensory information. They initiate responses to it. They can store the information. Um, and for us to be able to um, take it later if we need it, and it allows for memory generation and thoughts and emotions. And it also is composed of the spinal cord. And this helps to conduct signals to and from the brain, and it controls reflex activity. So those are two main things that we talked, we hit on this time, but we talked about it in detail for the past couple weeks. Now, today's lecture has been on the peripheral nervous system, right? And so it's divided into two parts. You have one and two here. We have the motor neur neurons, which basically is a central nervous system to muscles and glands, right, to activate those. And then we have the sensory neurons, sensory organs that are gonna bring information to the um, central nervous system. And um, we are gonna talk about basically um, senses in the next lesson and get into details on how those parts work to communicate with the peripheral nervous system and the central nervous system. Now, when we take motor neurons, they can be further divided into two different nervous systems. Here we have the somatic nervous system, which is going to control voluntary movement, movement, and we have the autonomic nervous system, right? And that controls involuntary things, the, the items that are there to help keep us alive. And so we have two things. We have this sympathetic division, right? And so when we have the sympathetic division, that's the fight or flight. And then you have the parasympathetic, which is rest and relaxation, right? And so we're going to hit on a few of these a little bit more so we can understand them. This is a great, great kind of um, table and chart, though, to help you understand how everything connects. So now that we finished kind of looking at how the entire nervous system breaks apart. Let's focus a little bit more on the peripheral nervous system more so. Let's look at the somatic nervous system versus autonomic and what does each control. So the first thing we want to kind of take a look at is the sensory afferent division of the peripheral nervous system. And you can see it has basically two main parts. We have both the somatic sensory and with that, it's going to be the general touch, pain, pressure, vibration, temperature, the proprioception that's in the skin, body walls, and limbs. And remember, that means the response to stretch in those areas. And so the special um, somatic sensory that we're going to get from here is hearing, equilibrium, and vision are examples of it. The visceral sensory, the general um, things that they will pick up on is stretch, pain, temperature, chemical changes, and irritation in the viscera. And so sometimes you can feel nausea and hunger 
from this sensory information. So the special senses that help to pick up on that is taste and smell. And so in the next thing we're gonna look at, that basically is bringing information from out, like from the sensory information and bringing it into the peripheral nervous system, right? And that's why the blue lines are coming, it's information's coming into it. So that is, remember, the afferent pathway. Now the peripheral nervous system can bring information out based on what it integrates in the information that comes in. And that's when we get to the afferent or motor division. And those are divided into two parts, right? We have the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. And so remember the somatic nervous system is motor innervation of all skeletal muscles. So do we get them to activate and move? Yes, that's the somatic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system, the ANS for short, is motor innervation of smooth muscles, cardiac muscles, and glands. And so what that's gonna do is talk about um, how those important parts in your body, how do they allow to keep you well rested and safe in different situations. So as you know, we have the two, we have the somatic division and we have the parasympathetic. And so the parasympathetic is more, like I said, the rest and relax. And this is the fight and flight. And so if you don't have any kind of stressors in your life, you do not want the sympathetic division to be activated. You want your body to be able to rest and relax because hormones can change during this time. For instance, the sympathetic division of the nervous system, if that's activated, you're looking at high cortisol levels, which is a stress hormone, and you'll learn more about that in the endocrine section of AMP2. And so, and that's known to cause a lot of homeostatic imbalances and potential problems with um, chronic disease conditions later. And so you really have to be careful for that. And in the society that we kind of live in now, those can be activated in terms of you're gonna get ready and you're about to go into the last two weeks of school, which is very stressful with a lot of testing. And it's all this idea of, the, it comes down to these last two weeks. How can I do these last two weeks, right? Because if you have an A, you wanna keep your A. If you're a kind of on that board of having like between a C and a D, you want to pass or maybe you're C or B. So all of those come into play and your body can't differentiate that stress from a bear chasing you. It can't differentiate you breaking up with your spouse or your boyfriend or girlfriend versus, you know, you swimming away from a shark in the water. It just doesn't. So you can see how long-term chronic stress can cause a lot of problems. And so comparison of the motor nerves in the somatic and autonomic nervous system. How do they work, right? And so you can kind of see, so let's start with the somatic nervous system, right? Here is this one that's right here. And when we look at this, the cell body is in the central nervous system. So here you can see all of these have the cell bodies in the central nervous system right there. And it's a single thick myelinated axon, if you can see that right here, single neuron that we're looking at here from the central nervous system to the effector organ, right? So this can extend from either a spinal or cranial nerve. and then it's going to release to the muscles. You can see the effector. And look right there, we've talked about this, right? So how does it communicate? With acetylcholine. And the effects on this is positive, it's stimulatory, it means it releases. So that's the somatic nervous system. Now the next one that we wanna look at is the autonomic nervous system. And so this uses a two neuron chain.
And so if we look here, you can see you have here, there is only one neur neuron, right? Here, you have one here and one here. That's what it means by it. And so basically, you can see, and then when we're talking about you saw that bump, those are the cell bodies. So you have this one right here that's called a preganglionic neuron. Let me write this in a different color so maybe you can see it. Preganglionic neuron. And as you can see, that one, the cell body is in the central nervous system. This is the post, and I'm going to just put that for the ganglionic, and you can see it right here. That first cell has a light myelination, that pre-ganglionic, and you can see it right there. And so this one is actually in the peripheral nervous system. You can see that. And that is going to basically form and talk to effector organs here, right? And you can see we're looking at smooth muscle glands and cardiac muscle. And so those are those autonomic. And so in this example, it's norepinephrine. Because if you remember, that's the fight or flight. also show that here you can see that it can have that preganglionic axon that's there with the cell body being the central nervous system and then it can actually go and interact with the adrenal medulla that again is going to release if you look here that's acetylcholine and that is going to act on the adrenal gland to release epinephrine and norepinephrine to basically allow blood vessels to constrict. Now the last one you can see, and this is rest and relaxation, right? And again, lightly myelinated preganglionic. It's in the central nervous system. It's where the cell body is. And you can see here, there's the ganglion, and that's the post, and it's activated through acetylcholine, and that's going to work on the muscles. So these can be stimulatory or inhibitory. It depends on the neurotransmitters and the receptors on the effector organs as whether or not they're going to be stimulatory or inhibitory. So the key to vision between these, there's two arms of the autonomic nervous system, right? We have the parasympathetic and we have the sympathetic. And so we can look, we see that fibers do originate in the brainstem and the sacral spinal cord. You can see here. And here. You can also see that we have these long, the preganglion fibers are really long here. And the posts are short. And those ganglion, those cell bodies are actually within the organs. So parasympathetic, if we want to talk about it again, just to remind, right? This promotes maintenance functions and conserves energy. And so this is, there are three major differences that we could look at on here, right? Between the, the anatomy of the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. So when we look at it, it's site of origin. So 
So where do they originate? And here we know brainstem and sacral. The relative lengths of their fibers. Their first cell, right? This is long. And the posts are short. And then the third one, and their third one is location of ganglion. So the location of that, right, all of these are, location is in the organ. And this, right, pre is long, post is short. So now let's look at what's happening in the, para, the sympathetic nervous system, right? Which this happens or is activated when it needs to mobilize body activities. So it's not just something that's happening, say, when you're getting chased by a bear, right? It can also be like moving around, walking, um, if you're running, different things that can activate kind of stress responses as well. And so when we're looking at that, they do, basically their site of origins are different. Because you can see for them, they're basically located in the thorax and spinal, in the lumbar part of the spinal cord. The preganglion are right there. They're really short where the post is long. And the ganglions, if you see right here, they're close to the spine. So the pre right, is short here, the post is long, they're opposite, right, and the location is in the, I'm going to put close to the spinal cord. Now, as you can see here, we have, do you see stomach is here, stomach is here, pancreas is here, pancreas is here. So this is what's called dual innervation. And so all visceral organs are served by both. But what we know is they cause opposite effects. So these two are antagonists. And so you have this antagonistic kind of um, dynamic between the two divisions. One is going to excite, the other one's going to calm. And so this is how they um, basically help you to move, maneuver through your day. Because it's just as important that you rest and relax and conserve energy for those moments that you can no longer do that. And it's important that you can activate your system to help get you away or get you through certain situations. Both of them happening all the time is not beneficial. And so when we're looking at the levels of the autonomic nervous system control, it is basically under control 
of the central nervous system. So we're looking at the hypothalamus, we're looking at the brainstem, and the spinal cord. And if you notice the hypothalamus, you're also adding the cerebral cortex to this play. Now this, the hypothalamus, is considered generally the main integration site or center of the, the um, autonomic nervous system activity. The cerebral cortex input can actually modify the autonomic nervous system, but it does so subconsciously. And you can see that here. And it does this by working through the limbic system. This is how the autonomic nervous system, the different control levels work. So basically the cerebral cortex can take information in and it can change things subconsciously by working through the limbic system, that's the emotional input center, and it talks to the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus is basically the boss of this whole process. And it basically does the overall integration of the autonomic nervous system, whether it's parasympathetic or sympathetic. And as it goes through from there, the brain stem regulates things like pupil size, heart, blood pressure, airflow, salivation. But whether it needs to basically um, go and increase or decrease activity as in responding to whether it's parasympathetic or sympathetic gets decided by the hypothalamus and it talks to the brainstem and then the hypothalamus will talk to the spinal cord and so that also allows for the reflexes for things like urination defecation erections ejaculation all of those things and so we have now finished everything that we're going to go through for both the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. And what we will do next time is start talking about special senses, specifically sight and hearing imbalance.